perfect. I've just been filled with dread and realised that before we went live, I didn't check uh, exactly how to pronounce your name, Jason. So I'm just going to go with it and just perfect. be polite. And be, <laughs> no, that was just, great. Just be. I'm more worried about your surname, actually. So just be polite and pretend I got it right, if that's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> got it. Welcome, everyone, to uh, episode 65 Um Absolutely delighted that uh, Dr. Dr. Jayashni Maharaj has agreed to join us at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. her time. So thank you so much for your time. We've been looking forward to this one as well because um, uh, it's on tibialis posterior, which is a tissue that we're all familiar with as as clinicians. Um, we, we see a lot of it in clinic. We think like uh, we've got an, an amazing researcher who's spent so many years of her life and, and her PhD looking at this. Um, so, yeah, we couldn't be more couldn't be more delighted to kind of do a bit of a deep dive into into tib post if if if, uh, if that's okay to call it that uh, and shorten it from that from this point forward. So, first of all, thanks for coming again, Jayashni. And um, where should we start? Uh, we had a few questions come in about this one, um, and a lot of them were sort of more about can we revise or can we at least start with the basics before we get on to the really cool stuff that your research and your you know sort of uh, discussion of supination moments and all that really cool physicsy <laughs> stuff. That I know gets everyone going. Uh, late in the night um, or early in the morning where you are, could we go back to basics and, and revise some anatomy, um, which is never a bad thing to do, but, uh, you know, some structural anatomy of, of TIB post, because I know um, I've certainly heard a lecture of yours online before, and one of the first things you opened up with was just how, how complex it is, which I think is, is worth uh, starting there, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks for having me uh, online and for the chat, Ian. Um, yes, yeah, so I've spent a bit of time, a little bit of time, um, studying the tibialis posterior. Uh, I think it's a beautiful muscle, personally. Um, it's got this beautiful structure um, and a really important fu function, actually. So, starting with its structure, um, it's a bipennate muscle. Um, so, going back further, sorry, it come, uh, sits in the posterior compartment of our leg. So it's one of the deepest muscles in our leg and it has two um, compartments, uh, so superficial and a deep, um, which has all the muscle fibers. Um, and then it's got this really long tendon. Um, so the muscle belly itself sits in approximately from the middle to the one third, uh, just one third of the leg. And from the distal one third of the leg, you have the tendon forming. Um, which then comes down behind the medial malleolus and inserts into basically every single bone in the foot except for the talus and the phalanges. Um, and so it's, it has this really important role um, in stability. Um, but primarily its um, structure, it consists of um, pennate muscle fibers. So what I mean by that is that its fibers are orientated um, at an angle rather than running um, parallel. And this is really cool because it allows it to um, have a really large cross-sectional area. And a really large cross-sectional area means it can generate lots of forces or higher awesome. forces. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Penate muscle fibers, long tendon, um, really important um, muscle. And the, the, its structure is really important for its function, actually. So, um, like I said, because the muscle has these penate um, muscle fiber orientation, it can generate large forces, which then have a consequence on its function. Like Perfect. Um, but before we get onto function, which mm. we definitely will, because I know the majority of your PhD and, and certainly the publications of yours I've read are very much about function. One more bit of sort of anatomy or stru structure to, to discuss, and that is the uh, often um, often read comment about it about its tendon having a set, a, a region or an area of avascularity mm -hmm. um, or an area which is more prone to you know, um, pathology or, or where symptoms seem to manifest. Any comment on that? Is there anything um, up to date or about that? Um, look, I've, I've read those studies too where they say around the medial malleolus there's a region of avascularity. Those studies are, um, are very difficult to do. They're um, very cellular level. Um, and not, yeah, and so I can't really comment on it. Um, I think with the development of technology and things, we'll be able to explore that area a little bit more um, and really figure out 
what areas are avascular and whatnot, but I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really comment on that. No, not at all. We always like it when someone says no, you know, says no, that's, that's cool today. Um, so c coming on to its function, um, and what's the best place to start? I mean, maybe we should just ask you to sort of explain a bit, I mean, I'm, explain a bit about what you did in your PhD, um, mm -hmm. what you, uh, you know, how you did it, what mm -hmm. you found, and then we'll kind of, you know, inevitably pull, pull things out from there. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess before I started my PhD, um, we kind of already knew a fair bit about to post. Like we knew that it was a plantar flexor inverter, um, and that's just its location relative to the joint axes. Um, and Jim Woodburn and George Morley's group um, down at Latrobe had done some really beautiful studies um, using electromyography. So putting wires into the tibialis posterior muscle to understand its activation. So that's what EMG lets us, tells us about. It tells us about um, when a muscle is active. Um, and these groups had done some beautiful studies um, across lots of, sorry, studying lots of different factors and how um, it influences the activation of the tibialis posterior. And, um, from those studies, we knew that, look, the tip post is active during contact, um, so after we heel strike, and then again um, during mid stance. And from those, we are like, okay, well, tip post has a really important um, role during after heel strike and in mid stance. Um, what I was really interested in during my PhD was how the actual muscle and the tendon functioned. So yes, we knew when the muscle was active and non-active, not active, but what I wanted to know was what is the actual muscle and tendon doing, okay? Um, so a lot of previous work um, at the medial gastrocnemius and triceps groups had shown that, look, the muscle fibers and tendon do very different things. Um, and the reason why they do different things is like the tibialis posterior, the medial gastrocnemius and Achilles tendon um, have a similar structure. And what, but what I mean by that is the medial gastrocnemius has these small, um, short, pinnate muscle fibers, similar to tip post that can generate lots and lots of forces. And the Achilles tendon is this long, springy tendon, right, that can change a lot of length. And so there was a lot of similarities in that regard to the tibialis posterior muscle, short, mes short pinnate muscle fibers and a long tendon. So if I go back to the medial gastrocnemius, we know that the medial gastrocnemius, the tendon does a lot of the length change. Yeah, and that's because it's a really elastic tissue. Um, so what I wanted to know was, does this also happen at in the tip post? Um, we know the tip post undergoes or experiences a lot of um, dysfunction or it's uh, predisposed to tendinopathy, strain-induced tendinopathy. But I kind of wanted to know, okay, is this because of its function um, and how it functions during walking? Does the tendon experience more strain than the muscle and why does it do this? Um, so those were kind of some of the things that at a very basic science level I was interested in. Um, and then I wanted to see how things like foot posture and foot orthoses, clinical things, um, how that affected uh, the mechanical function of the tibialis posterior muscle and tendon. So actually, do you want to know what I found? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the rationale to why I did what I did. Um, what we found was, so to study what we studied, we used um, ultrasound. So we have these really cool um, long ultrasound probes, which we attach to the leg. Um, and oh, I've got some images here, actually. Can we put these? Can we put this image? Up? Yeah, just use the share. Just use the share screen button at the the green button. Audience love an image as well. So this is perfect. Unless unless they're listening to the podcast after the fact, but um, sorry if you're listening oh, to the oh. podcast. Um, <laughs> So this is one of my images. So here you can see this blue, this is a person walking. Um, we've got the markers, um, the pink markers on it. 
um, to quantify your motion of the different um, segments. So by shank and the multi-segment foot model to quantify motion of all the different segments in our foot. But here you see this linear transducer um, and we attach this linear transducer to the leg um, using elastic bandage um, and to capture that to capture the fascicles of the tibialis posterior we attach it to the front of the leg so just so it's like attached on the anterior aspect of the leg and so what you can see here is an ultrasound image um, that we capture and so we've got your skin up here and a little bit of fat, um, your superficial compartment of tibialis anterior, your deep compartment of tibialis anterior, and then down here you can see we've got tib post. And tib post, like I mentioned before, um, has a superficial compartment and then a deep compartment. So I um, look, I investigated uh, the length changes of the fascicles. Um, during walking in the superficial compartment. And you can see here that um, it starts down here. So that's where we mark the starting point. That's the ending point. And it, because it's at an angle, we can also measure its pination angle. And then I think I've got an image here. Sorry, these are just slides that I had. Um, but here's a video of how we actually track the length changes of the fascicles. Um, so that's what the tibialis posterior muscle fascicles do during walking. Um, so this is one stride starting at heel strike and ending at heel strike. Um, so if I stop this, so basically what we showed was, so I measured that in a whole bunch of people. Um, and what we showed was that actually during walking, um, the muscle fibers are pretty isometric. Um, they, they do shorten a little bit during propulsion, but generally they function in an isometric manner. And that's kind of cool because this allows the muscle to generate these really high forces. So that was cool. We go, okay, the actual muscle belly, it functions in a generally isometric behavior, but we know that the whole muscle tendon unit, so the muscle plus the tendon, it's not functioning in an isometric manner during walking at all. We know that at heel strike, it lengthens and then it shortens during um, push off. Um, and we modeled this. Um, I modeled it using some um, of my foot models that I've um, created during my PhD and we can talk about that a bit later. But so the question was, if the muscle fascicles are behaving relatively isometrically, then it must be the tendon that's doing all the length changes, right? Um, that's the only other tissue. Um, and so that's what we kind of showed during our PhD was the fibers actually function isometrically and it's a tendon that's responsible um, for all the length changes. Um, and it's kind of neat that it's the tendon um, because one of the cool things about long stretchy tendons is that they can stretch and absorb energy um, and then they can recycle that energy during leg stance. Um, so that's where we get into some of the energetic work, which I can delve into if you would really like. But in a nutshell, that's what I kind of was really interested in and what I guess my uh, PhD added to the literature was instead of just looking at the EMGs and the activations of the tibialis posterior, I measured what was actually happening in the muscle fibers and at the whole muscle tendon unit length and therefore was able to understand, okay, the tendon lengthens during um, heel strike, um, during pronation, um, and then shortens during late stance um, and the lengthening during um, that initial contact phase is probably what predisposes it to injury um, because as the tendon lengthens during that early heel contact it has to absorb energy um, and so that's what i think is predisposing it to injury but Perfect. does that it's make amazing. sense yeah absolutely it's great and i definitely want to take I'm going to call your bluff and take you up on the offer of coming back to the energetics later, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I get too do, excited about the energetics. So. 
Right, rightly so. And, <laughs> and, and before we do, let's just ask the question that's probably on most people's minds, and you sort of alluded to it very briefly, which is where does where does foot posture come into this? Because we, you know, it's it's the most historic belief, isn't it, that that uh, a more pronated posture, for want of a better description, will be will predispose you more to this problem, and that would kind of tie in sort of with what you said there with regard to the greater lengthening and eccentric demands as we pronate. Um, and I know in some of your work, um, having, having glanced across the PhD, that you looked at the, the sort of correlation between foot posture. Um, so what were your findings there? Is, is, is the classic more pronated foot the, 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 the guarantee that this is going to be more of a problem? Yeah, so that's um, why I also investigated, because um, there is this belief that, yeah, having a pronated foot posture um, predisposes you to um, to post tendon dysfunction or tendinopathy but using the measures that I used so I used the arch height index uh, the foot posture index and the foot mobility magnitude um, I actually couldn't create uh, any sort of model to understand the variance um, in the moments, subtalar joint moments and energetics um, found. Um, when I added step width to the equation, yes, I could, um, I could create a model uh, to understand or um, predict some of the variance in the subtalar joint moments and energetics. Um, so based on the measures that I collected and the population that I looked at, which was quite extensive, to be honest. Like I looked at over 50 something people. Um, so I did get a fair bit of variability as well in the data um, across the population, should I say. So foot structure per se, I couldn't say has a direct um, link um, to um, subtalar joint moments and energetics but in saying that there's a lot of new um, cool techniques that are coming out which might be able to um, help us better understand this relationship um, we we pick out a couple of random not random but we pick out selective points when we look at our chart index and we only look at certain things like six variables when we quantify foot posture index I don't know if that's a true representation of the whole entire foot. The foot is quite a complex structure. Um, something like 3D foot scans or something like that might be able to give us a better indication of foot structure and then um, be able to help us understand how that um, uh, predicts tip post tendon um, strain. Um, similarly, it could be um, more deeper. It could be at the bone level, the structure of the actual bone. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, no, there was no relationship between the measures I looked at, but it, that doesn't mean to say that a more broader structure or a more deeper structure, like the actual bone structure, or, um, may have a relationship. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Actually, but before, sorry, and before we go any further, look, I've just yep. posted a couple of links to your paper, um, papers oh. that covering some of that. But Simon Spoon has just asked a couple of questions, but I'll just pick on one of them. Um, the other one can wait, Simon. Um, just a quick comment. How, how were you measuring the subtalar joint moment? And he said here, and I think it's a typo, midline if foot. I think midline of foot. Does that yep. make sense? Yep. Um, okay. Um, so that's a really great question. So typically um, rear foot moments um, are measured um, between the tibia and the calcaneus in a somewhat six degree of uh, freedom and a six degree of freedom uh, manner. What I did was that I created a foot model during my PhD um, in open sim. And in OpenSim, we can model joints as a six degree of freedom, or we can give them more uh, biological um, joint axes, as we could say it almost like. Um, so my subtalar joint axis was triplanar. So similar to um, what the literature has um, 
illustrated and what Kevin says a lot about is so it um, was an oblique axis that allowed for pronation and supination to occur. So there were triplanar um, moments. There weren't just inversion, inver eversion moments, there were triplanar. So they included um, the dorsiflexion, planar flexion, eversion, inversion, and abduction, adduction into it together. Does that make sense? Um, so that's how we calculated um, moments, um, yeah. of course, using ground reaction forces yeah. and kinematics. No, sure. Well, I've just, I've just linked to four of your papers in the chat. So I, I think if they want to know the, the nitty gritty details of how you measured it, that they'll be yeah. described in that they'll be described in the methods of those papers. Absolutely. And um, soon we'll um, also um, make our model open access once we've validated it. So you can play around with it. And I don't have a good, good enough inverse dynamics knowledge to ask any more questions on that. So I'm just going to quickly sidestep into um, you. You mentioned midfoot mobility magnitude, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to double check. Um, well, I wanted to ask you what you found with regard. We we talked about what you found with regards to foot posture and tib post correlations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you what you found with regards to foot mobility mm -hmm. and tib post. But before I do, just check that it's the I'm visualizing the, the same midfoot mobility magnitude. Is it the one that Bill Vincenzino used for his yeah. classic kind of treatment direction test for patellofemoral pain? Is it that same one? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So there might, there might be a few people watching that aren't super familiar with that. So do you mind just quickly describing how you would sort of clinically sort of assess uh, someone's mo mobility? Cause it's something that's fairly easy to do in clinic. And then what, what the link between that was or wasn't with, to post pathology. Absolutely. Low, yeah. Um, so foot mobility is looking at the change in the arch height and the width of the midfoot uh, from non weight bearing to weight bearing. Um, so there's lots of intricacies on how to measure it, but fundamentally it's a change uh, from non weight bearing to weight bearing. So as, as you put weight, on the foot and so what we're kind of looking at is what is the change um, what is the mobility of the foot um, and so yeah like um, other groups have shown that this is quite an important uh, measure um, when trying to well I guess what people have shown is that it's more of an intermediate measure between static um, fun, uh, posture and more dynamic mobility and so that's why I also integrated it into my model so that study that you're alluding to Ian um, I was just more interested in holistically what is the influence of posture and mobility on function so I um, was trying to come up with multiple variables that a clinician could apply in uh, private practice to be able to predict um, tendon stress and strain um, but unfortunately I wasn't able to create um, any sort of thing like this because these measures aren't um, they just weren't able to predict it so I they, I put foot posture into the mix I put foot mobility into the mix I had a few other uh, measures um, into the model and try to go, okay, if I put all these different measures into it, which ones help me predict it? And both foot posture and mobility weren't able to predict it um, that much. Foot mobility had uh, some sort of relationship um, with the energetics, um, but it was very moderate to mild, so mild to moderate. So I wouldn't be going saying, use this stuff. <laughs> and and the step width let's quickly touch on that as well because i think yeah. that's uh, super interesting because we know in the in the um in the running literature we've got some step width uh sort of uh, recommendations for sort of uh, reducing itb strain and and tibial stress you know if someone runs with a narrow step width we, we often encourage them in the presence of itb or mtss to, to increase their step width oh, are we is my interpretation of your paper that craig's just showing here that with someone with tibialis posterior sort of um, issues, we, we we could or we should be encouraging them to increase step width as well. And this is is this walking, running, or or both? Um, yeah. So one thing that came out of that foot posture and mobility paper was that we could create start creating models to predict tendon stress and strain um, or subtalar joint energetics 
um, using step width. And so I was like, hey, this is kind of neat. This is not something that I had thought about. So I did a subsequent study um, and got several um, participants to walk at different step widths. And we measured um, subtelar joint moments um, and energetics. And yeah, what we found was that as we increased our step width, um, the moments and energy absorption and power generation reduced significantly. So I measured subtelar joint mechanics, but um, if you go back to some of my publications, there's this direct link um, between what happens at the subtelar joint um, and the tibialis posterior tendon um, function. So yeah, I, I think step width is a really cool, exciting um, thing that we should be paying a little bit more attention to because it's quite a easy, I say easy, um, a modifiable factor that doesn't, it's hard to train, but I think it's got potential, a lot of potential there, definitely. And the results, if you have a look at the paper, are really clean and beautiful and show that, yes, there's this direct relationship there. Um, how it happens or what it, its effects are on the clinical population is a different study. So all my research to date has been in normal, healthy people. Um, but I guess we have to start somewhere. Mm, yeah, um, and makes makes complete sense if it's reducing stress, energetics, joint moments that that in a pathological group. That's they're the kind of things that, rightly or wrongly, we would clinically be trying to do anyway. Um, absolutely. With, with with our intervention, so uh, so very, I know it's a big big step to pardon the pun, but a big step to make when we haven't got the data to support it. But I think it's a. As Craig always says, it's it's, co it's theoretically coherent, biologically plausible at this at this stage, isn't it? Absolutely, um, and that's kind of like what photo therapy. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, but ultimately, no. that's what for, the point of photo are. Photo try to change moments and energetics, and so if we can, if we've got this step width, which also changes subtelar joint moments and energetics, it could be a simple. Um, simple thing to look at, um, even just to look at, okay, when you're watching your um, participant, oh, participant, patient um, <laughs> uh, walk, maybe just observing the step width and um, um, writing notes on that um, would be in, in interesting in itself. Um, yeah, and definitely. A, and an easy point to start. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we've, we've mentioned foot orthoses now, so, you know, that, that cat's out the bag. We're going to come on to them. Unless, Craig, there's any other questions that are re re No, let, let's keep on with the theme. There's a couple of comments there, but I'll, I will save them to the end. Um, they've sort of been okay. covered, but, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, just shout out if you need. I haven't got the comments in front of me, so shout out and mm -hmm. interrupt me if, if, if you need to. But, um, yeah, let's talk orthoses then. Not, not because, you know, um, they're the only thing we do. They're not the only arrow in our quiver, obviously. Um, but uh, inevitably, it, it is the, the, the topic that, like, that we like to talk about when it comes to these things, these, these low, low extremity pathologies. And also, just speaking purely from personal experience, and I'm, I'm quite a... Uh, a sort of uh, reserved in my prescription of orthoses. I, I don't dish them out too, too regularly. A lot of my physiotherapy colleagues actually uh, tell me I don't dish them out enough, actually. But um, <laughs> the the one, rightly or wrongly, the one thing I see that I'm, I'm perhaps falsely confident that I'll get a good result with is usually tibialis posterior mm. problems. I'm not, I'm not saying I always get a good result, just to clarify, but I'm saying when people come in with, you know, four foot space occupying lesions, I'm like, oh my goodness, not this, you know, is this going to, work but tip post i'm always a, i've always got that slightly elevated confidence and i think it's because it just makes so much mechanical uh sense so i'm hoping you don't kind of shoot me down on that one but can we speak to some of your research um because i know you you included orthoses in one of one of your papers i read this morning and i forget, forgive me because i can't remember which one it was but you certainly talked uh, about um i oh, hear it is you talked about orthoses could, could you speak to what the research is currently telling us about orthoses effect on of course the subtalar joint energetics the the the, uh, the energy absorption perhaps of the tibialis posterior tendon etc yeah absolutely so i um i'm on a similar boat to you ian like when i prescribe my orthotics uh to post tib uh tendon dysfunction patients i'm quite 
I'm more confident that it's going to be produce an, a positive outcome. And I guess um, when I did this study, it was a kind of thing that I was like, yes, I'm definitely going to find positive results here and it's going to, it's going to be great. Um, but I learned some other things from this study. So, so start, to start from the beginning, um, for this study, I collected data on about 18 to 20 uh, participants, healthy participants. Um, they all had a pes planus foot posture, so um, based on the foot posture index. Um, and I prescribed them custom made foot orthoses. So I made a plaster cast of every single participant. We sent the orthoses away. Um, so the actual shape of the orthotic was customized to the participant. Um, even the, uh, in my protocol, the, the thickness of the shell device, so we used a polyprobe device, but the thickness was dependent on the weight of the participant. Um, but because all our participants had a very similar weight, they all got the same thickness um, and I think I gave them a five degree um, rear foot bearer's post. So a three quarter pretty stiff device um, is what I prescribed these patients, uh, participants. I then uh, took a pair of athletic footwear, so uh, gel lighty, uh, lighties from ASICS um, and I looked at three different conditions. So barefoot walking, no running in this study, just walking. So barefoot um, walking, walking with just the ASICs, and then walking with the uh, footwear and the orthoses. So I had a barefoot condition, a, quite a compliant um, foot footwear um, shoe, and then uh, a stiff shoe in a potentially compliant footwear yeah so those are my three conditions what i found was that in the footwear and the foot orthoses conditions so the last two conditions the moments and the energy absorption at the subtella joint reduced significantly so there was this huge effect um, in moments and in energetics um, with the two conditions but what I didn't find was a difference between the uh, footwear condition and the footwear and orthoses condition. And so I was trying to understand why this could be the case. And so one of the reasons I think um, there was no difference was that the footwear was quite a compliant um, structure. Um, whereas the authorities was much stiffer. And if you go back um, to what I said about the function of the tendon, the function of the tendon is to absorb energy during that initial heel contact phase. So we know that footwear these days is created or designed to absorb energy, whereas my stiff foot authorities wasn't really doing that. Um, so in that study, basically, we found that um, whilst both footwear and foot orthoses um, reduced the moments and energetics, I think the effects were more due to the footwear rather than the orthoses. Um, and this um, was really interesting and makes me think that we can do more about designing and prescribing uh, foot orthoses, like looking more um, at cool designs and how we can alter the stiffness of the device, um, because I think that might have um, a different or an additional effect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And kind of uh, makes complete sense when you think about it clinically, whereby someone often says, even you know, if they don't have the ability or finances to seek out a medical opinion, they often just seek out the pair of shoes in their, in their closet that is most comfortable. And chances are it will probably be some kind of walking boot or, or trainer, uh, which yeah. is uh, you know, w where we'd always start to advise. So interesting thing evolving here where we could essentially take someone and say, make some good footwear choices, increase your step width. And we're probably, you know, sort of on the right track for, for, for a group of people, aren't we? Before we've even asked them to sort of consider orthoses or, or you know, as we're going to 
you know, rehab or you know strengthening of the structure etc which we should probably talk about shortly as well actually yep. now it's come yep. to mind um no that makes complete sense it sort of marries with with clinical experience and things doesn't it um Craig, anything that's come in? Any, no, anyone no. ask any questions? I think everyone's just so engrossed in listening. Um, <laughs> you yeah, know. me too. Um, <laughs> well, I know, you know, let's talk a bit about, if we can, just about um, strengthening the tendon. I know I'm going yeah. a bit, you know, off, off no, script here. And I, know you, I know it's not your, it's just suddenly come to mind that, you know, when someone comes in, the sort of things we would work through, we would reduce, as Craig always talks about, reduce the load on the tissue, which I think is kind of what we're talking about here, and then give the tissue some ability in, at some point in the future to, to tolerate or cope with greater load, mm-hmm. i.e. Increase its, increase its capacity. Any experience from your work or, or the people you surround yourself with in this work about the, the sort of golden ways to, to, to do that, you know, rehab wise, what, what do you use clinically and what are your thoughts on the evidence base for sort of strength uh, for this tendon and what works and what doesn't? Absolutely. I think um, strengthening is really, really important for uh, this dysfunction and condition. So I'm going to just start back with a bit more uh, basic science. So we've got a tendon um, and for strain induced injuries, we know it's the excessive strain that's causing the injury, okay? So then if we take a step back and go, okay, what is causing this strain in this tendon? So the tendon has uh, structural properties and material properties. And the material properties is like its composition and generally across um, our bodies, um, the material properties are very consistent um, across different tendons. What changes, however, is the structural properties. So like I said to you um, before, like having a long tendon means it's gonna be really stretchy, yeah? So there's two things that we can change in a tendon um, to influence or uh, prevent strain. We can change the length, which we really can't change, or we can change its cross-sectional area, okay? Um, cross-sectional area um, determines how much stress it induces so how much stress goes through it um, and therefore its strain and so if we want to change the cross-sectional area of the tendon we look at strengthening exercises because generally what happens is uh, more strengthening exercises increases I've lost Craig uh, (laughs) increases the (laughs) cross-sectional area (laughs) don't worry he doesn't he does that sometimes. Just, just carry on. <laughs> just <bail>. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's that's the mechanism of how strengthening will help our tendon. Um, and I know there's been a few. Um, there was a really nice randomized control trial actually um, that looked at eccentric exercises, concentric exercises, and strength uh, stretching with phototheses. And they too found that eccentric exercises um, really helped it. And with eccentric exercises, there's a lot more force going through that muscle. Um, so a lot more load. And this, I, if you measured the tendon um, structure, would influence the cross-sectional area of the tendon and therefore help it that way. So increasing strength increases the cross-sectional area, reduces the strength. And so, yes, definitely. Go down Definitely that track. Do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and just more more sort of um, I guess practically, <laughs> what are your go to? What are your go to? Just in case you know, I know we've got a wide range of people that watch this. Some people that are very engrossed in rehab on a regular basis. Other people probably um, dip their toe in, and others maybe haven't looked at it since they graduated. So what are your go-to, uh, do you have any kind of favorite exercises that you found uh, you get the most bang for your buck or that, that, that uh, your patients are most compliant with or, or like most things do you, do you tailor it depending on the context? Yeah, I um, tend to tailor it. Um, but uh, some of my favorites are probably some exercises with the TheraBand as well as heel raises. I really like the heel raises and you really, for, um, to post, you really need to get that end range of inversion going on. So not just the plantar flexion, but the plantar flexion with the inversion. Um, I, I like to prescribe those too, but I'm sure there's a lot more people out there that know a little bit more uh, <laughs> about that. Than me. We've all got our favorites, haven't we? Yeah. Go on, Craig. I'm just going to make a comment on the, the, the strengthening issue 
and I, I know it's a little bit, it's a question without notice, but I keep referring back to, and, and I can't remember how it is or the authors, the, the study through about five or six years ago that looked at muscle strength and runners and how rapidly it declines after the age of 50. So the, the, the patient population we're looking at with things like post hip tendon dysfunction, you know, tend to be in, in that way. I, I struggle a lot with the concept of strengthening when muscle strength is declining naturally anyway with aging. And, you know, can we make it stronger or can we just perhaps slow the declines? I'm, I, I don't know. I'm just starting to question the value of it in some patient groups because of that natural um, decline. This, this, this group tends to be either very active or um, sedimentary, like quite yeah. inactive. And I think in the inactive group, um, if you really, like I said, want to reduce that strain mm. um, on that tendon, you kind of want to increase its cross-sectional area. So mm. it's mm. kind of about looking at the tendon and trying to influence or change it a little bit. Like sometimes you don't need huge changes either. Um, mm. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, no. Yeah, no, yeah. thanks. You yeah, know, I, I just struggle with the concept of, yeah, I, I, I also think about the... Because it's the, not all about just increasing the force generation by the tendon, right? Yeah. Um, because a lot of people think, hey, let's strengthen a muscle and let's get a greater force output from this muscle. It's, that's not the point of it here. We're trying to do it to increase the, potentially the cross-sectional area of the tendon. So the... Mm. objective or the priority is slightly different mm. that's the no. take i might take on it yeah. yeah i see it a lot in um just classic overload classic overuse so they're definitely younger i wouldn't put mm. them in the category you know i wouldn't put them in the category yeah. of decline and, and actually um they quite like being given you know homework exercises <laughs> that they know can if you sell it as them being a mm. you know a more efficient mm. runner after all you know you got to sell it right obviously absolutely um, <laughs> no other questions craig before we no nothing think nothing just... the, the, the couple of comments couple of questions but they're not quite relevant to the th thread we're on so we'll come back to them cool i'm um, just looking at the time i was just before we yeah. wrapped up i just wanted to uh ask Deshni about uh you know because we know when people finish their phd they don't just give up right it's just a constant ongoing slog so you'd, i know you're definitely going to be working on something at the moment it's probably cool and exciting so uh, as much as you're allowed to tell us what what, what does where does the future uh, research kind of um, direction for you look like it's taking? And is there anything you can tell us about that might be coming that we can get excited about? And is it all going to be tip post or are you going to, are you going to step away from tip post a bit? Uh, so I'm really interested in uh, measuring stresses and strains in muscles and tendons uh, to understand both how it can improve our efficiency of more powerful or more power generating movements such as walking and running um, but I'm also really interested in uh, measuring stresses and strains because of its relationship to injury and in the foot measuring stresses and strains is difficult right now we have these great beautiful foot models out there but they don't really have tissues associated to them and so that was one of the things that I did in my PhD I created a foot model um, that has tissues attached to it. So the tip post tendon was my first um, tissue that I added to it, but it's got lots of other tissues in it too. And so what I'm currently doing is I'm trying to validate this foot model, I'm trying to create a method or uh, something uh, that people can use, at least play around with for clinicians, um, but use in research to measure stresses and strains. And there's many ways to validate foot models. Um, so previous groups have used bone pins um, and looked, put bones, uh, bone pins in bones of the foot and got people to walk and seen how their bones actually move that way. But one of the really cool things that I'm really excited about is um, we're using uh, high speed video radiology um, to measure this. Um, so this is essentially, we have two X-ray systems attached to high speed cameras. Um, which um, take pictures, one picture, uh, 250 frames per second um, of all the bones in the foot as you walk and run. Um, and so using that uh, and CT uh, scans, so we create foot model, we can actually quantify how the bone 
the actual bone is moving during walking and running. I have some videos here. I'm not sure if you want to see, but that's that's where my future is. We definitely uh, want. We definitely want to see. Okay, I'll show you. Uh, <laughs> Plus, anyone listening to the podcast after the fact will now have to be forced to come back and watch the video as well because they'll think they'll have FOMO. They'll feel like they're rich. <laughs> um, so, like I was, can you can, can you see the screen now? Yeah, no, it's it's yeah. looking good. So this is your two X-ray systems, and if I try to play this, so here you can see the foot coming into uh, motion, and we oh, basically cool. have that during walking and running, and then. Uh, these little orange foot models, uh, bone models, are created from CT scans. So we take CT scans and we segment each slice up and we create these bone models. And then what we do is in a program called Otoscoper, we align um, a process, we align the bone uh, model to the x-ray. And we do this for all the bones in the foot. Um, and so this is called biplanar video radiology. So I'm using this technology to validate the foot model. And so here's my foot model at the moment um, compared to the biplanar stuff. And you can see it does pretty good. So my model is in gray. We've got the whole tibia there. Um, we've got the midfoot, forefoot, um, cal calcaneus and talus. And the pink bones are the bones that were measured um, from the x-ray. Uh, images um, and you can see that it does a pretty decent job actually um, so that's where my future kind of sits at the moment where I'm trying to create these tools that both clinicians can use and play around with to see how different movements can change stresses and strains in our tissue but also researchers can use um, to investigate footwear, foot orthoses, other factors, strength training on um, how we function and how these tissues function. That is very cool. That yeah. is very cool. I like it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Right. My list is all crossed off, Craig. So unless no, you've got well, that, anything that's, pressing. That's, that's probably a good note to finish on. Look, there have been a couple of comments, a couple of questions, but uh, maybe if Janisha can later on come back, you know, to the, discussion and just post a comment on, on the thread rather than address them now because a couple of them are actually quite big issues and a couple of them are quite a bit off the topic of the theme that we're talking about so perhaps this is a really good time to, to sort of wind up so thank you so much for getting up before 6 a.m your time <laughs> 7 a.m my time for, for that um for those of you who have joined late we have had quite a few people watching during the the the, the live which is which is great if you come back in about 10, 15 minutes, the full video will, will be on Facebook. It'll be on YouTube um, later today. So thanks so much, guys. Happy Christmas, by the way, everyone. Yeah. And um, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That was amazing. And um, have you have a great Christmas. And we'll um, hopefully catch up Monday. Thanks for having me. Merry Christmas.